sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's like, who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Hey there, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're taking a look back at one of Hughes' famous road trip comedies. Nope, it's not National Lampoon's Vacation. Well, up and at him. It's the Thanksgiving classic, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. John Hughes is back pulling triple duty as the producer, writer, and director of this timeless masterpiece and his first real attempt at a holiday movie. Steve Martin and John Candy headline this holiday comedy about an odd couple who embark on a three-day cross-country odyssey to get Martin's character home to Chicago in time for Thanksgiving Day. While these two actors make for quite the perfect pairing, their characters are on wildly different ends of the personality spectrum. Is this a coincidence or what? <laughs> Have a seat. According to Hughes, he was inspired to write the script after having a similar experience himself while on an actual flight from New York to Chicago. Like the film, his flight was diverted to Wichita, Kansas, and it took him five days to return home. Naturally, like any of Hughes' screenplays, he wrote the first draft in only three days. Like, it took me two and a half years to write Rock Center, and three days to write Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Four, or did it go into five? At this point in his career, Hugh's average writing time for a screenplay was about three to five days, with 20-something rewrites by the end. So thanks for making this all feel like even bigger pieces of shit, John. This is the fastest writer in the world. As we mentioned before, the film stars Steve Martin as Neil Page, a tightly wound marketing executive. Martin was convinced to join the production after reading two of his favorite scenes from the script, the seat adjustment in the car, along with the F-bomb tirade at the car rental desk. How may I help you? You can start by wiping that fucking dumbass smile off your rosy fucking cheeks. Martin's co-star, John Candy, plays Del Griffith, American light and fixture, director of sales, shower curtain ring division. A lovable yet irritating shower curtain ring salesman. Best in the world. Originally, Hughes wanted Tom Hanks and John Travolta for the roles of Neil Page and Del Griffith, but Hanks was too busy shooting big. I guess I can see Hanks playing either role, but Travolta playing Del would definitely make Neil wonder if he was trying to kill him or screw him. <laughs> oh, you, you thought I, no, go ahead. Oh, I would? Go ahead. What do you think I am? Yeah, no. <laughs> God, no. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. As for Travolta, Paramount execs did not want him in the film because he was considered box office poison at the time. Rick Moranis was also considered for Neil, while John Goodman was considered for Dell. Layla Robbins plays Neil's wife Susan Page, who was actually 13 years younger than Martin in real life. The incredible Michael McKean also shows up playing a state trooper. He receives fourth billing despite only appearing in one scene for about 90 seconds. His role was actually supposed to be much longer, as his character was intended to provide additional exposition. Which is that they have overshot Chicago. They have gone 100 miles past Chicago. And I tell them you're never going to get to Chicago if you keep doing this way. Upon hearing this news, Neil attacks Dell and winds up chasing him around the car, which the trooper has to comically break up. But as the script went through revisions and plot points were changed, Hughes discarded most of the scene and reshot it as a traffic stop, leaving out any information about where they were or about the pair being lost. Michael McKean had to return to New York to shoot this condensed version, which explains the continuity issues between the sunny and snowy skies. Hughes regular Edie McClurg plays the infamous car rental agent. With Hughes' guidance, her role was partially improvised. Hughes told her to simply riff a fake phone conversation with someone about Thanksgiving plans while Steve Martin stares daggers at her, waiting for her to finish up. In fact, it was all McClurg's idea to have her character speak with her sister and ad-libbed. You know I can't cook. <laughs> Impressed, Hughes asked her how she came up with those lines so quickly, and she answered that, like his scripts, she just used inspiration from her own life. To this day, McClurg claims that random people ask her to tell them that they're fucked. Dylan Baker plays Owen in his feature debut and essentially created this character himself. The snorts, facial tics, and twisted expressions are all his own making. 
the actress who played his silent wife, Louie Newcomb, said it was extremely difficult to keep a straight face while shooting the scene with him. Another instance where Hughes incorporated an improvisational moment was during this character's introduction scene. After being dissatisfied with several takes, Hughes privately instructed Baker to wipe spit in his right hand just before shaking hands with Martin's character. Steve Martin was not expecting this, thus his disgusted reaction to shaking Baker's gross hand. The film crew reportedly exploded into laughter as Martin ran off to wash his hands immediately following the encounter. Hughes got the reaction he needed, and the footage was kept in the final film. Another frequent Hughes collaborator, Ben Stein, shows up as a Wichita airport rep. I'm sorry to announce that we're canceling flight 909 due to severe weather in Chicago. Martin Ferrero also has a small role as the second motel clerk. You may know him from his more popular appearance as the lawyer who gets eaten while on the toilet in Jurassic Park. Larry Hankin plays the devilish taxi driver. Ferris Bueller's father, who is played by Lyman Ward, even shows up as Neil's business partner. Okay, it's not really Ferris's dear old dad, but this could have easily been the start of a John Hughes cinematic universe. Bill Irwin shows up as the man on the plane. Irwin would go on to work with Hughes again in Home Alone. He's also known for his role as the cranky old man in Seinfeld. Oh, listen, uh, before you go, would you mind changing my diaper? Ah! <laughs> Kevin Bacon makes a quick cameo as a man racing Steve Martin for a taxi. Bacon would go on to star in Hughes' next film the following year, She's Having a Baby. The director of Pretty in Pink, Howard Deutsch, was originally slated to direct this film, but once Steve Martin signed on, Hughes opted to direct the picture himself. Principal photography on the project lasted a total of 85 days, mostly shooting around New York State. Additional scenes were also shot in Missouri, Ohio, and Illinois. It was intended to be shot in Chicago, but the production crew had to hop from state to state to find enough snow for the look of the film. During filming, Hughes kept rewriting the script, which made the amount of footage he shot much longer than what the original screenplay entailed. Hughes shot over 600,000 feet of film, which was almost twice the industry average. When he turned in his first cut, it was 3 hours and 45 minutes long. That's pretty remarkable considering that the final cut is a lean 92 minutes, with credits included. Apparently, this longer version also featured a subplot about Neil's wife not believing his situation and suspecting that he's with another woman, but ultimately was cut. Initial test screenings were poorly received, as audiences viewed Dell as a mooch and Neil as his patsy. Well, who let you stay in the room? I even let you pay for it so you wouldn't feel like an intruder, which you most certainly are. In order to remedy this, Hughes and editor Paul Hirsch restored a subplot about their credit cards being mixed up as well as dialogue to display Dell's intention to pay Neil back. I was gonna send it back to you with whatever the rental car charge was, plus interest, but you didn't give me your address. What was I supposed to do? Some additional footage not included in the theatrical cut is a scene with Dell and Neil trying to eat in flight from New York to Chicago. Dell rants about which meals he orders according to what airline he's flying. If I'm flying United, I'll say I'm a youngster. I'll give me the kitty plate. That's a hot dog, a bag of potato chips, a gherkin, and a nice little bag of Oreo cookies. Mm. In the scene, Neil's dinner is lasagna, which due to numerous delays, has been reheated several times. Unsatisfied with his meal, Neil gives it to Dell, who shares it with Bill Irwin, the old man next to Neil. Another cut scene was Dell ordering a pizza and a six pack of beer at the first motel. We even hear Neil mention the beer spilling all over the bed sheets. I left him on a vibrating bed. What did you think was going to happen? And the robber was actually the pizza delivery boy who they stiff on the tip, since Neil asked for a salad but was given pizza instead. Other deleted scenes featured the pair heading to a strip club to find a phone after their car catches fire, Dell doing an impression of Elvis Presley by singing into his hairbrush, 
and Neil punching Dell in the face after he mentions not having bought insurance for the rental car they destroyed, which is why he has a black eye towards the end of the film. Lastly, there was a different version of the ending where Dell follows Neil all the way home, but Hughes decided in post-production that Candy's character would finally take the hint and let Neil return home alone, before Neil has a change of heart. The footage used of Neil on the Chicago train was shot in between takes without Martin knowing. Hughes thought Martin had a beautiful expression in that unguarded moment, and it works wonders in the final film. According to Hirsch, a two-hour version of the movie still exists, but he doesn't know where it is, and most of it has probably deteriorated by now. Neil's house was also a set built entirely from scratch, consisting of seven rooms and taking about five months to complete. It ended up costing the production $100,000, which angered Paramount executives and caused major turmoil on set. <laughs> The exterior of the rental car was designed to resemble that of the Griswold station wagon from another of Hughes' previous productions. For that infamous rent-a-car sequence, no transportation company wanted to appear inept or deficient in any manner, so crews constructed a set that mimicked an airline terminal, designed a rent-a-car company logo and uniforms, and rented 250 cars to pull off that sequence. The film was released theatrically on November 25th, 1987, appropriately the day before Thanksgiving of that year, finishing in third place for its opening weekend. By the end of its box office run, planes, trains, and automobiles grossed just shy of $50 million worldwide against a budget of $15 million. The film was lavished with praise, with many critics commending Hughes for branching out from teen comedies as well as the acclaimed performances of both Candy and Martin. The soundtrack is less eclectic than previous Hughes films, with it featuring a mix of rock and roll, country, pop, and folk music. One of my favorite sequences makes extensive use of the song Mess Around, performed by the great Ray Charles. Everybody here's gonna have some fun doing the mess around. Charles was actually Candy's co-star in the Blues Brothers film. A little known fact about this film is that Elton John was actually commissioned to compose the theme song. He had nearly completed writing it when just two days before he was set to record it, Paramount Pictures issued a last minute demand that the original song master become property of the studio. Elton's record company would not allow this due to contractual obligations, so a deal could not be reached and he had to withdraw from the project. Instead, Paramount opted to license Paul Young's Every Time You Go Away as the movie's theme song, and sadly, Elton John's original theme was never recorded. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles marked a shift in John Hughes' filmography, surprising many who had pigeonholed Hughes as a teen angst filmmaker. Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel gave it two thumbs up, with the former saying the film was founded on its perfect casting, and the latter declaring it John Candy's best role to date. Well, until Uncle Buck, but we'll get to that episode soon enough. Thankfully, there really hasn't been talk of any sequel or bizarre television adaptations to this heartfelt holiday classic. That is, until August 2020, when it was announced that a remake was in the works starring Kevin Hart and Will Smith. Both of these actors' respective production companies were set to produce the film, but ever since that Oscars fiasco, this project is most likely in limbo for the time being. There's also an Indian film called Anbi Saivam, which bears a similar plot and characters to Hughes' film, but is not considered a remake since the story unfolds much differently. I suppose you could also view the Robert Downey Jr. and Zach Galifianakis vehicle, no pun intended, due date, as a quasi-remake of this film, but it definitely doesn't hold a candle to Hugh's brilliant madcap cross-country comedy. Both John Candy and Steve Martin regard it as their favorite film within their own storied filmographies. I also love that Hughes didn't care about the rating of this film, clearly, since it could have been rated PG-13 or even PG if it wasn't for that car rental sequence, where Steve Martin drops the F-bomb 18 times. This film might also mark the first instance of Hughes using that trademark cartoonish effect of characters turning into skeletons. We would later see this used again in Home Alone 2. I love how visceral and over the top the sound design is. You can tell that the Foley artists really had a ball with this film.
You're gonna freeze to death out there. I mean, who wouldn't? It's chock full of excellent character moments. I like, I like me. And memorable dialogue that is quoted to this very day. Wiping that dumbass smile off your rosy cheeks. I really can't stop gushing about this film. I love watching it any time of the year, but especially around Thanksgiving. There's really not that many films that can be considered Thanksgiving movies. And I'm someone who even counts the original Spider-Man film as one of those. I think what works for this film is that it's not centered on the holiday itself, but rather on the attempt to get home in time for the holiday. That's it. That's the goal. And boy, what a ride it is thanks to the match made in comedy heaven that is Steve Martin and John Candy. If there's any deeper meaning we can take away from this film, it's that even though we may live clashing lifestyles, we can all come to the realization that despite our differences, we're all just human in the end. That's why this warm conclusion really elevates the film, as it finally clicks for Neil about Dell's tragic backstory, so he invites his less fortunate friend home for dinner with his family. And isn't that what the holidays are all about? And on that note, I award planes, trains, and automobiles five out of five turkeys. And as always, thanks for watching. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. Who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Ah, the great outdoors, the fresh air, the smell of pine. Take it in, take it all in. The warmth of the fire at night, the scenery porn, the art of bra removal, and not to mention the lack of good parking. As you probably guessed by now, this week we're taking a look at The Great Outdoors, a 1988 family comedy directed by Howard Deutsch in his third collaboration with John Hughes after Pretty in Pink and Some Kind of Wonderful. Written and produced by Hughes, the film tells the story of two families spending their week-long vacation at a lake resort in the fictional town of Pechogan, Wisconsin. There's only one problem. One of the families wasn't invited. Anybody home? So, as the real tagline used by the film says, this is no holiday, this is war. Yes, this film is another in the long line of Hughes' vacation comedies. In this movie, the two titans of comedy, Dan Aykroyd and John Candy, team up for the ultimate family vacation gone wrong. Chet's plans for a quiet vacation at the lakeside resort quickly take a turn when his obnoxious brother-in-law, Roman Craig, and his snooty family appear unannounced and ready to join in on a season of fun in the sun. And in the whole week you'll be here. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, the only thing these two in-laws have in common is their intense dislike for one another. Soon, it's brother-in-law against brother-in-law in an uproarious and hilarious fight to the finish. <laughs> At least according to the back of the Blu-ray case. The film also includes another hallmark of Hughes, a post credit scene, where three members of a foul-mouthed raccoon family return and talk in their language about Jody, the bald-headed bear. Of course, there are plenty of scenes that'll make you crack up before we reach that point. If you have a favorite, share it with us in the comments. And if you enjoy our shows, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and like this video. John Candy steps into his most relatable role as Chet Ripley, who just wants to spend some quality time with his wife and kids. This film would mark Candy's fourth collaboration with John Hughes, but would certainly not be his last. Dan Aykroyd co-stars as Roman Craig, Chet's smug, silver-tongued brother-in-law and supposed investment broker. Hugh's first choice for the role was Chevy Chase, and wanted to reunite Chase and Candy for another film after National Lampoon's vacation. But Chase had already committed to Funny Farm, released in the same month of that year. Hughes briefly considered Bill Murray after Chase bailed, but Murray was on an acting hiatus and wouldn't return until Scrooged. It was then that Candy suggested Dan Aykroyd, whom he was a close friend of. While they had co-starred in several films together, such as Blues Brothers and Spielberg's 1941, this would be the only time the two actors would share top billing. Stephanie Ferrissey plays Connie, 
Chet's wife and older sister to Kate. You may recognize her as Max and Danny's mother, Jenny Dennison, from Hocus Pocus. What are you supposed to be? Madonna. Connie's sister and Roman's wife, Kate, is played by Annette Bening in her feature debut, believe it or not. Chris Young stars as Buck Ripley, the eldest son of Chet and Connie. Whoa, Buck is a young Uncle Buck? I smell prequel people. Also something worth mentioning is that the actor also produces projects like Disney Channel's The Proud Family movie. He's clearly a man of culture. Ian Giotti plays Benjamin Benny Ripley, the younger son and Buck's brother. Real life twins Hillary and Rebecca Gordon play Kara and Mara Craig, the children of Roman and Kate. The only other screen credit for them is The Mosquito Coast, starring opposite Harrison Ford. Rounding out the rest of the cast is Lucy Deakins as Cammy, a local girl and waitress who Buck develops a crush on. Character actor Robert Prosky pops up as Wally, the owner of the cabin that the Ripleys and the Craigs stay in. Britt Leach appears as Reg, a man who has been struck by lightning 66 times, then 67 near the end of the film. God, that's gotta hurt. Nancy Linehan has a cameo as a waitress. You might recognize her from, well, pretty much everything. She's been in My Name is Earl, Everybody Loves Raymond, Malcolm in the Middle. I'm trying not to dwell on God standing over us with that giant shovel. Bye. You name it. Bart the bear as Jody, the bald-headed bear, the grizzly bear who lost her fur on top of her head during a previous encounter with Chet. Reportedly, the cast was super impressed with how well-trained the bear was, and Bart even had a reputation with some directors he previously worked with, dubbing him the John Wayne of Bears. That said, Deutsch recalls Bart not always taking kindly to his notes, as Bart's trainers struggled to fit the bear with the bald headpiece that the film required. Deutsch remembered that it took days to get the shot since Bart pawed it off every time they put it on him. If you want to see more of Bart, here he is at the 70th Academy Awards presenting the envelope for best sound editing to Mike Myers. Fun fact, Bart the Bear's performance in 1988's The Bear received critical acclaim, so much so that there was apparently an Oscar nomination for Bart but it was unable to move forward due to animal actors being precluded from receiving Academy Awards. But that's a story for Bart the Bear Revisited. As we mentioned, Howard Deutsch teamed up with Hughes a third and final time to make this film. Hughes had intended to direct the film himself, but scheduling conflicts with She's Having a Baby did not allow it. When filming was set to commence, John Candy initially arrived to set with a big beard figuring it would suit his character, who was a big outdoorsman. Fearing audiences would not recognize him or enjoy the look, the studio made him shave it prior to principal photography. That's too bad because John Candy could pull off a beard. While the film is set in Wisconsin, around Lake Potawatomi, Minnewank, the film was actually shot on location in Bass Lake, California a small resort town near the Sierra National Forest. Ducey's Bass Lake Lodge, a rustic 1940s resort, was featured as Wally and Juanita's Perks Pine Lodge. The Loon's Nest vacation cabin, built on the back lot at Universal Studios, was designed to match the style of Ducey's existing cabins. Sadly, the lakeside restaurant, Ducey's Bar and Grill, burned to the ground shortly after filming in June 1988 due to a gas fire. Fortunately, when the restaurant was rebuilt in 1991, the owners paid tribute by adorning it with posters and memorabilia from the film as a reminder of the original restaurant. And that scene where Chet tackles the old 96er at Paul Bunyan's cupboard, there's actually a restaurant in northern Wisconsin called Paul Bunyan's Cook Shanty. But the gigantic steak isn't on the menu. Sorry, folks. Oh, Even though Chet says they're in Clara County, Wisconsin, the bald-headed killer bear of Clare County. There's no actual county by that name. There's Euclare County in Wisconsin. And when writer B.J. Hollers of Volume 1 asked director Howard Deutsch if that's where the film takes place, he could neither confirm nor deny it. However, he did remark that John Hughes had likely vacationed somewhere in Wisconsin since he had grown up in nearby Chicago. 
In the original script, Hughes had Roman's redemption come through a daring rescue of his twin girls who had caught a giant fish that towed them around the lake in a small rowboat. I guess the filmmakers never learned from Spielberg's troubles on the production of Jaws because they built a mechanical fish for the film, but when it would not work properly, the script was rewritten around the legend of the bald-headed bear and the chase sequence in the third act. Even though the setting obviously takes place in the summer, the film was shot in the fall of 1987 over three weeks. The filmmakers hired professional greensman Dennis Benda to spread redwood bark for Bart the Bear to walk on and wired leaves on trees to mimic the appearance of a summer season. Similar to a lot of Hughes productions, there's a ton of material left on the cutting room floor. Chet talking affectionately to a mounted moose head. You remember me, Chet Ripley? How you doing? Roman uttering an unearthly belch at the dinner table. <laughs> and Roman with his annoying laugh in another scene. You can find this footage in the film's original theatrical trailer. And who knows? With planes, trains, and automobiles getting a 4K release in the near future with the additional lost scenes included, maybe there's hope for the great outdoors to receive the same treatment. The poster used in marketing was actually designed to look like the cover of a British publication called The Great Outdoors, and, I'm guessing, partly inspired by John Hughes' time working with the National Lampoon magazine. There's also an alternate poster for European territories that display the same image of Roman and Chet, but the grizzly bear is the one holding Chet up by the scruff of his neck rather than a fishing rod. The film was released into theaters on June 17, 1988, and opened to $6.1 million. It was a modest commercial success, grossing $43 million worldwide against a $24 million budget. The lower than expected box office haul may have been the result of mixed reviews and a failure to click with audiences. However, once it hit home video, it garnered a massive following and has since become one of the most popular summer vacation movies. The film was also shot under the working title Big Country, but was changed to avoid confusion with Tom Hanks' as Big, which was due to come out around the same time. Some of the criticism seems rather harsh. This movie is lame and dumb and slow and no good. Look, it's certainly not the finest film any of these filmmakers ever made, but it's wonderful escapism and a great time at the movies. While the film doesn't boast quite as awesome of a soundtrack as other Hughes productions, it still has a rockin' one featuring tracks like the aforementioned Land of a Thousand Dances, Yakety Yak by the Coasters, Yakety Yak! Don't and quite a few songs by the Elwood Blues Review, as in Dan Aykroyd's character in Blues Brothers. Before the great outdoors hit theaters, Aykroyd, Candy, and Chris Young portrayed their roles during the end credits of Hughes' previous film, She's Having a Baby. They're among the people who pitch potential names for the baby boy of Jake and Christy. Hmm, names for a boy. Well, my wife's always been partial to Bor Bor. Or you could go uh, silly and call him uh, Skippy. There's been talk of a reboot starring Kevin Hart and produced by Michael DeLuca, the current CEO of Warner Brothers. However, the project has been in development hell ever since Universal announced it back in April 2017. Wonder which one we'll get first, the Great Outdoors remake starring Kevin Hart or the Planes, Trains and Automobiles remake starring Kevin Hart and Will Smith. More recently, in November 2021, Aykroyd told in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter that he was working on a sequel with Howard Deutsch called The Great Outlaws. The proposed follow-up would bring back Roman as a Ponzi scheme guy who victimizes a federal agent. In that same interview, Aykroyd also mentioned that he was looking for the candy figure to cast in the film. Dan, if you're watching this, my vote is for Pedro Pascal. Guy's got the comedic chops to back it up and chemistry with pretty much anyone and can even hold his own against Nick Cage. You should go and I'll stay here. I love that plan, I do. But you are a faster runner than me. I saw how fast you were in National Treasure. No, that'd be the stunt department. Not according to the making of feature right. While the pairing of Dan Aykroyd and John Candy is amusing, a similar dynamic is accomplished much better in planes, trains, and automobiles with Steve Martin as the straight man. Not that Candy isn't good at playing it more straight, but Dan Aykroyd is more Cousin Eddie than Candy's Del Griffith. However, it's still a breeze to watch thanks to the banter between these two comedy legends. How about the gourmet here? You know what he wanted? Hot dogs. Okay. You know they make those things out of, huh, Chet? You know? 
Lips and assholes. <laughs> and a very lean 90 minute running time. Plus, John Candy could pretty much elevate even the most mediocre of scripts. I was just trying to have some fun. Oh, God. So I made the fangs a little bigger. Jeez. I'm not saying that there aren't better films in Hughes' catalog, but The Great Outdoors is certainly one of the more underrated ones. It may not live up to the hilarity that National Lampoon's Vacation unleashes, but does it really need to? Not every movie needs to outdo the one that came before it. Although, I will be the first to admit, it does feel a few outdoorsy gags shy of being a truly great classic. But at the end of the day, it's just nice to spend quality time with family and friends. And it sure beats watching She's Having a Baby. Not even Kevin Bacon could save that movie. And on that note, I award The Great Outdoors three bald-headed bears out of five. As always, thanks for watching. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's weird, right? Who do you love? Ow, 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 no, no, sit, sit. Hello, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're babysitting the kids and whipping up some ginormous pancakes as we hang out with the one and only Uncle Buck. Who are you? I'm your Uncle Buck. Released in 1989, the film was produced while Hughes was on a collaboration hot streak with John Candy. With it being the third movie the pair made together in the span of three years, preceded by Planes, Trains, and Automobiles and The Great Outdoors. Not to mention Candy's previous appearance in one of Hughes' earliest works, National Lampoon's Vacation. Uncle Buck centers on a slobbish bachelor who babysits his brother's teenage daughter along with her younger siblings while the parents are away dealing with a family emergency. His relationship with his girlfriend, Shanice Kobolowski, experiences some friction due to the fact that she wants a husband and a family, but Buck won't commit because he loves his carefree lifestyle too much. To his family and friends, Buck seems like the last person you would think of to watch the kids. Hey, I, I, I'm real sorry about those bushes, too. I had no idea that they would all catch on fire like that. You know, you were right. I should never have put the barbecue that close. However, by the end, Buck matures into a more responsible family man thanks to his time spent with his nieces and nephew. The film might be Hughes' most underrated directorial effort, and if you agree, you'll probably love our other content too. So why not like this video and subscribe to our channel so you can be notified each time a new video goes live. Obviously, John Candy plays the eponymous character of Uncle Buck Russell. Believe it or not, Candy wasn't the first choice for the role. There were other high-profile actors up for the part, with the studio heavily considering Danny DeVito to star as the drinking, smoking uncle. Not that Danny wouldn't have made the part his own, but Candy nails every single scene he's in. I mean, in the wrong hands, lines like this. I would just like to hear the pitter-patter of tiny feet before I die. I'll get you a mouse and a piece of sheet metal could come off far meaner, but with Candy, it just comes off lovable. You really can't picture any other actor in the role. No. Hughes's fruitful working relationship with Candy on the set of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is what really landed him the gig. His girlfriend, Shanice, is played by Amy Madigan. His brother, Bob, is played by Garrett M. Brown. You may recognize him as Dave's father in Matthew Vaughn's Kick-Ass. Rick Moranis was also another name that was considered for the role. Bob's wife, Cindy, is played by Elaine Brumka. Jean Louisa Kelly plays Tia, the eldest rebellious daughter. The role was actually her feature debut, and the process to find the right person for the part was long and arduous. I recommend that you stay out of my personal life. Before Kelly was cast, Hughes first sought after Winona Ryder after seeing her in Beetlejuice but she was too busy shooting Heathers to accept the role. Even though most of the story's conflict stems from Buck's relationship with his moody niece, the two actors got along quite famously off camera. There was zero animosity between them, and Kelly shared that it was an honor and a privilege to work with Candy on this film. Aw, oh, that's sweet. Macaulay Culkin plays Miles, the middle child. This was the film that essentially got him the part of Kevin McAllister in Home Alone. After impressing John Hughes with his precociousness on set, the mailbox scene where Miles interrogates Shanice is how the idea for Home Alone was planted in Hughes' brain. I'm gonna put 
please take it out of there? Take it out! The youngest child, Maisie, is played by Gabby Hoffman. Funny enough, Amy Madigan, who plays Shanice, appeared with Hoffman as her mother in Feel the Dreams, which released the same year as Uncle Buck. Jay Underwood plays Tia's CD boyfriend, aptly named Bug. What's his last name, Spray? <laughs> Lori Metcalf plays Marcy, the neighbor who lives across the street and attempts to have a fling with Buck. Even though the role is minor, Metcalf gets in some decent one-liners. Is there a big sexy guy in here? Suzanne Shepard shows up in a brief role as Anita Hogarth, the strict assistant principal of Maisie's school. Mike Starr plays Pooter the Clown, a birthday clown who Buck rejects for being drunk. <coughs> While he's hard to recognize here, take off the makeup and you may know the actor as Frenchie from Goodfellas or Mental from Dumb and Dumber. Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? <coughs> if you have a keen eye, you can spot another familiar face in the film. During Maisie's scene in the school, the classmate sitting next to her is Anna Klumsky who would go on to star in My Girl with Macaulay Culkin. Small World. This was the first film directed, written, and produced by Hughes under a multi-picture deal with Universal Studios. Principal photography commenced on January 4th, 1989 in Chicago. The film was initially supposed to take place in St. Louis, but it was changed to the Windy City because unusually warm weather in Missouri that year forced the production to move to a more wintry climate. The production company decided to keep the film facilities and locations as close by as possible. Like the majority of John Hughes' productions, they filmed at the vacant New Trier High School in Illinois. Three of its gyms were converted into sound stages to house the sets, such as the two-leveled interior of the Russell House. The school was also equipped to suit the needs of the production crew, classrooms for the young actors, wardrobe department, editing bays, a special effects shop, equipment storage areas, and a projection booth. Buck's signature car is a 1977 Mercury Marquis Roam, which he affectionately calls the Beast. The filmmakers used a combination of a gunshot and a firecracker to create its backfiring noise. You be home. Uncle Buck's theme also might sound familiar as it's a beat from rapper Tone Lock's Wild Thing. Also, for that hilarious interrogation scene between Miles and Buck, Candy implemented a useful method to help the young actor fire off the lines. For Culkin's close-up, Candy stood behind the camera and held handwritten lines from the script, which Candy wrote out by hand himself, above his head for Culkin to recite as quickly as possible. Are you my dad's brother? What's your record for consecutive questions asked? 38. I'm your dad's brother, all right. At one point, following a long day of filming, John Candy hit up a pub with the music supervisor and several locals. The next day, Hughes heard a radio interview where a caller beamed about his time meeting the actor the night prior. Hughes was not pleased, and when he confronted Candy, the actor claimed Buck was supposed to look disheveled in the upcoming scene, so he thought the excursion was okay. As a result, Hughes canceled the day of filming and ordered Candy to get some rest. The production was shot, wrapped, and released theatrically as well as on home video, all in the very same year. Shit just moved faster back then. The film was released on August 16, 1989, and earned $8.8 .8 million during its opening weekend, placing number one at the box office. The film retained the top spot for three more weeks before being bumped down the second by Sea of Love, starring Al Pacino. Nuts! By the end of its theatrical run, Uncle Buck rose $79.2 million worldwide against a $15 million budget. At the time of its release, the film was met with mixed reviews. Strangely, Roger Ebert gave the movie one and a half stars out of four, writing that Uncle Buck was unusually bitter and angry for a Hughes film. It's strange the way this movie generates creepy feelings that work against everything it's trying to do. By the end of the movie, I wasn't sure that I would want Uncle Buck uh, living in my suburb with me. Uh, were we watching the same movie, Raj? This is essentially John Candy's Mr. Mom. They even reused the same gag of drying the laundry in the microwave. Which actually works, we found out. <laughs> you can actually do it. 
Ebert and Siskel said it was like watching two different movies because of the relationship he has with the two young kids and then the one he has with Tia. I think they were too dismissive because all that means is that all the fun scenes involving the kids just made me love it as a kid. You should see that toast. I couldn't even get it through the door. And then the more mature themes just make me love it as an adult. You ever hear of a tuna? <laughs> you ever hear of a ritual killing? <laughs> Oddly enough, after its home release, the VHS and poster artwork were altered. So instead of the original image of Uncle Buck knocking on the door with the entire family on the other side locking him out, three of the older family members were removed completely from the image. The hope was that the film could be marketed as a kid's movie, and to also promote the two young popular child stars. I think that was kind of a weird move, since it is a family movie, and there's something for everyone, parents and kids included. The year after its initial release, CBS aired a television adaptation of the film starring Kevin Meany as Buck, except the premise was much darker. Buck is named the legal guardian of the three kids after their parents perish in a car accident. Yeesh, good thing Roger Ebert didn't see that one. But hey, a similar concept worked for Full House. Dead parents were all the rage in the 90s. It was a stupid car accident, Grandma. The number came up. <laughs> the pilot actually caused a minor controversy in 1990 due to a scene where Maisie says, Mom, you suck! The first time this had ever happened in an American network TV series. Blasphemer! Interestingly, no cast members carried over from the film, except for Dennis Cockrum, who plays Pal, the man hitting on Tia in the bowling alley scene. He's the only cast member to appear in the show, although he strangely plays a different character named Skank. Ain't no Skank. Hughes was emphatically unsupportive of the idea of turning any of his films into TV shows. He tried to talk Paramount out of the Ferris Bueller TV series, and subsequently refused to help Universal in any way with Uncle Buck. Taking care of three kids was the last thing I ever wanted to do. In fact, Hughes didn't even know the show existed until its producers asked to use exterior footage the director shot for the film. Let me get... you not... give me a... Aww. Both sitcoms premiered in 1990 and were dead within a year. The show was canned thanks in part to poor critical reception, and after CBS moved it to Friday night to establish their own TGIF lineup, but its ratings quickly plummeted and ended before the rest of the episodes could be aired. However, what's old is new again, and this time ABC gave the property another chance. In June 2016, a second TV series premiered starring Mike Epps in the title role and Nia Long as Buck's sister-in-law. And it too suffered a similar fate as the previous incarnation, with it being panned by critics and canceled only after eight episodes. Uncle Buck, there's a drawing of a naked lady in the bathroom. Yeah, there is. You need to study that, little man. I learned more in the toilet than I did in school. Oh, that's not all. In 1991, Uncle Buck was remade into an Indian film called Uncle Bun. It starred the prolific Indian actor Mohanlal as a younger version of the character named Charlie, who earns the nickname Uncle Bun for some reason after winning over the younger children. This iteration of the character still possesses a heart of gold and a love of music, along with a newfound fondness for pets, particularly rabbits. There's also a bizarre subplot involving his sister-in-law Sarah deeming Charlie responsible for the untimely death of her youngest sister, Rosie, who once used to be Charlie's love interest. And you thought your family was weird. And if you're interested, the entire movie is on YouTube. Before we wrap up, I just wanna take a moment to discuss some slang I discovered in the process of researching this episode. Well, I'm Uncle Wart. Just old Buck Wart Russell, that's what they call me. Or uh, Melanoma Head, they'll call me that. Apparently, the term Uncle Bucked refers to the act of being in a photo at the time of the taking, only to find out that you have been cropped out. Oof. Another usage of this phrase is to use a drill to unlock a door. And the last notable meaning has to do with an urban legend surrounding a non-existent deleted scene 
or Uncle Buck takes a dump in the shower and has to squish it down the drain with his foot. Again, I must stress that there is no actual scene depicting this. I'm telling on that one. Honestly, I have a deep appreciation for this film. I'm not sure what old Roger Ebert was referring to, but to me, this movie is like a nice warm hug. Sure, there's a coarseness contained within. Your nails are digging to my arm, god damn Pick it. Pick it up. But that just adds to the appeal for me and helps the film age well. Like a fine wine, it's only gotten better with time. Even after all these years, the punchlines still land, soundtrack still slaps, and the edits are still slick. Like the heartbeat sound effect match cut with the phone ringing to signify the inciting incident of the heart attack. tells the story very well and walks a fine line between vulgarity I'm gonna shove my load into you whether you like it or not come on <sighs> and family friendly hilarity this might be my favorite collaboration between Hughes and Candy even if Candy's performance in planes trains and automobiles is the flashier role similar to the ending of that film the final shot of Uncle Buck is a freeze frame of John Candy's face even though the man had a world class charm and wit his expressions could say a thousand words Uncle Buck is a heartwarming look at someone realizing they have what it takes to be a good parent and how family responsibility can bring out the best in us. It's a timeless story about family, personal growth, and being there for the ones you love. In the pantheon of John Hughes's films, it was his final great directorial effort. And on that note, I award Uncle Buck five out of five bowling balls. As always, thanks for watching.